Hello, and welcome to the Think JSAL webinar series, brought to you by the Office for Strategic Engagements at the Joint Special Operations University. Today, we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAL network. Please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the United States government, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Special Operations Command, and the Joint Special Operations University. If you have questions after the session, please email thinkjsal at jsal.edu. Welcome to Think JSAL. I'm your host today, Doug Jordan. I'm a professor of international education and security cooperation. Today, our guest is Mr. Jason Schenker. Jason is a futurist, economist, and author. He is the president of Prestige Economics and chairman of the Futures Institute. He has given over 1,000 keynote speeches and over 1,000 television interviews. Mr. Schenker was named a LinkedIn top voice in 2024 and he has been named LinkedIn top public speaking voice and top economics voice since 2023. Over 1.1 million students have taken Jason's 20 LinkedIn learning courses on leadership, economics, and emerging technologies. He has authored 36 books, including 15 bestsellers on such topics as energy, leadership, and the economy. Bloomberg News has ranked Mr. Schenker the number one forecaster in the world in 26 categories since 2011, including U.S. jobs, oil prices, natural gas prices, industrial metals prices, the euro, the Russian ruble, and gold prices. Mr. Schenker is one of 100 CEOs in a nonpartisan Texas Business Leadership Council, a board uh, leadership fellow for the National Association of Corporate Directors. And finally, he is a 2023-2024 non-resident fellow of Joint Special Operations University and the U.S. Special Operations Command. Jason, uh, welcome to Think JSAL. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for having me here, Doug. It is a pleasure to be a non-resident fellow for JSAL and a pleasure to join you here today for this Think JSAL. We've selected a very interesting topic. Uh, Jason, you and I have collaborated on an article on the DOD's challenges uh, in recruiting and how uh, that uh, in turn affects SOCOM. So today, uh, Jason is on Think JSAL to discuss these challenges to military recruiting um, and what we need to do to try to achieve our mission. All right, Jason, you are a highly respected economist. Please tell us about how you see the challenges to recruiting from an uh, economic perspective. Um, Specifically, what made you decide to kind of look at this topic? Thanks for asking me about this, Doug. You know, I think there are a number of key factors that are impacting businesses across the economy that are also impacting what's going on in the DOD. So Jason, specifically, how have these economic uh, factors directly influenced current recruiting challenges? So there are a number of key things as we dig deeper. And so I'm someone who's looking at the labor market, I'm looking at the economy, and really as we drive down into the details, the truth is that right now the US job market is very, very hot. There are over 9 million open jobs based on the initial December 2023 data, the JOLTS data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And yet we also know there are only 1.8, 1.9 million people collecting unemployment, which means there's 7.1, 7.2 million more open jobs than there are people. And so you've got strong economic growth, which is leading also to lots of open jobs, and that leads to competition to hire people. This is a really big issue because every employer is struggling. For many, it's like the Hunger Games. They're trying to get those employees in, and, and you can tell that it's really challenging for every business. And I know we don't normally think of the DOD or SOF as, as, as businesses that are competing for talent, but they are, and the war for talent right now is really, really hot. And you add on top of the strong growth and 
the, the very tight labor market, the strong jobs, all that stuff, you add to that high wages that you've seen just since between February of 2020 and January of 2024. Just in that period, wages have gone up $6 an hour. And so that's really competitive for all areas. And you've also seen really tight labor markets in the Southeast and the Midwest, which are historically strong bastions for recruiting for the U.S. Department of Defense. Wow, those are a lot of factors that maybe not everybody considers. Absolutely. And these things that are impacting every business, they're impacting DOD and soft recruiting. So looking at the uh, traditional, historical, potential recruits for not only the DOD, but for soft, what do you think has changed? I'm looking really for those dynamics at demographics and demographic shifts. And we think about what's going on in the US, like we know we have a rising age in the population and we have falling birth rates. We also have high youth obesity rates, those are at record levels. We have record high levels of use for legal drugs like ADHD medications. And then we have semi-legal or illegal drug use, especially marijuana. And all of those factors are taking potential recruits out of the pool of people who could enlist. And that, those are new challenges. A lot of those things are at record highs. So at a time when you've got a highly competitive labor market, you've also now got highly unfavorable demographics and trends that are pulling even more potential people out of the, out of the pool of applicants who could join DOD. And when you do that, you pull more people out who could be recruited into soft within the DOD. Jason, why is recruiting such a big issue for the Department of Defense and the United States Special Operations Command if, in your opinion, it's just a symptom of the tight labor market? Thank you very much for asking, Doug. This is about so much more than the labor market. Because on the one hand, you've got this really strong labor market, which I know you and I talk about the recruiting piece, and we've talked to other folks in the DOD, and there have been calls to action around this. And I, I think sometimes folks in the DOD, they're very concerned. They think it's just a DOD thing. It is not. It is going on all over the private sector. But you add on top of that that there are restrictions around enlistment, and that makes things tighter still. And then, of course, there are really critical strategic imperatives to find a solution to DOD recruiting and also to special operations recruiting that far exceeds the imperatives that we see that private sector companies face. Right now, we have Cold War II geopolitical tensions that present fractal conflict risks. We see what's happened with the Russian war on Ukraine. We see what's going on with Iran's axis of resistance. We see the tensions with China and Taiwan. We see the tensions with Venezuela and Guyana. We see tensions in other places. And in order to project effective deterrence, that means we need to have a fully functioning, fully recruited U.S. military. And we want to maintain a full volunteer military, which means we need to hit those recruitment numbers. Our goal, above all others, for the U.S. military is to maintain an all-volunteer military. But we also have a need to project effective military deterrence. So th this is a real tension, right? Because if you want all volunteers and you want effective deterrence, you need to make sure we're enlisting enough people. In addition to making sure we have enough people in the Department of Defense, you need to make sure we have enough people who are enlisting, who are being recruited in order to fill the soft pipeline with high qualifiers. The Special Operations Command obviously wants to have the best recruits they can, and that means they need to be able to draw from a large pool of DOD recruits. If you don't have a big enough pool, that's going to affect who you can pull in to all the different soft arenas. So that's where the recruiting piece is, but there's also a desire, because we want to make sure we're maintaining that all-volunteer military, that we don't need to call up reservists or the National Guard, which could become severe problems if we face a conflict. And of course, a top priority is to avoid a draft. And if we end up in a large military conflict and we don't have enough people in the Navy, 
in the Army, in the other branches of the U.S. military, because recruitment is down, that's going to be a really big problem, right? Because calling up reservists and, and the National Guard, those are terrifying options enough, but if we have big enough shortfalls, the risk of a draft is just a, 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 an absolutely third rail for most people to consider. But if we end up in a conflict and don't have enough people in our military, that becomes a real risk. Now, would I put that as a high probability risk? No, but it's a much higher probability than it should be. And it's a major risk because we aren't filling the pipeline enough. There's a piece with that because having a draft or bringing up, uh, bringing in the reserves or National Guard, I would assume that's gonna have uh, impact on the, rec the civilian recruiting also because you're taking people away from their civilian jobs so it's a second and third order effects. So, uh, you know, again, is the, the Guard and the Reserve is, if necessary, total mobilization, but at that point it is stressing the entire economy. Absolutely, right? And we have such a tight labor market pulling even more people out, especially in fields like healthcare, where there are massive numbers of unfilled jobs, where we have with an aging population, ever growing healthcare needs, you start pulling out reservists and National Guard out of any industry. Uh, but I think especially now of healthcare, uh, that, that will have massive ripples across the economy. Also first responders. First responders as uh, well, of school course. School teachers. Absolutely. Uh, you know, people that, that belong in the Garden Reserve or serve in the Garden Reserve, um, often they work in other federal agencies also, so it's also affecting other aspects of the government. And, and a lot of uh, reservists and National Guard who work in special operations are high-performing people in other, you know, in their civilian career also. So. Absolutely. And of course, look, these are none of the options we, we want to consider. We need to talk about them because it's the implication. If you don't have enough people enlisting, you, you need to project deterrence. We need an effective military where, you know, at some point, where do we get the people if the people aren't being recruited or aren't enlisting? This is why this is such a horrific problem and such a serious challenge and why you and I have been yeah. working on this now for many months. So, uh, what are some ideas or suggestions that you have for addressing some of these issues? I'm glad you asked this question. I see two potential groupings of solutions. The first grouping falls under what I know in the work we've done, we refer to as new pools of talent. And this involves a few separate areas. This includes demographic targeting where we might be looking at targeting specific demographics and trying to create more applicant pools where we're tapping into people who are most likely to enlist. The next area would be applying tiered standards. By reducing standards in certain areas and changing the rules and regulations around enlistment or recruitment, we may allow ourselves to recruit more people and that will help to fill the pipeline, both for overall DOD recruits and for SOV. Of course, there are three other solutions we've talked about before that I think are really good. And the first is short-term commitments. You know, we've talked about having commitments of around the two-year mark, right? Trying to get people to enlist with a shorter commitment. That might be a be better opportunity sometimes in terms of boosting the recruitment, tapping that new pool of talent. There's also the MAVNI program where we take people who'd like a fast track to U.S. citizenship. They're not U.S. citizens when they enlist, but that's one way we can get there. And of course, transparency around recruitment limitations. I think sometimes there, in, in our discussions and the research we've done, we've seen that there isn't always transparency around what might exclude you from uh, being recruited uh, or enlisting. And so that transparency can also, I think, make things a little bit clearer. It's less of an opaque process. And the easier it is to see through the process, the easier it's going to be for people to, uh, to say yes and, and join on. I know that the second point you want to talk about is a little different. It, it's more uh, not so focused on the qualifications of the recruit, but the way that the recruits are being communicated to. Absolutely. This is really a modern marketing approach. And I know this in our research together, this is an area where you are a big driver pushing for, for some of these ideas. And we've worked together on some of these uh, to come up with what might be really, really good ideas. A lot of this has to do with marketing the younger generations. 
and making sure that the advertising is targeting the younger people. This idea is as simple as you gotta bait the hook to catch the fish. And if you wanna market to younger people, you might need a younger marketing strategy. And I know in different parts of your career, focusing on communication and marketing and a, a lot of that, that is, is really, really right in there. There's a lot of initiatives that are being discussed. Um, I think that there's opportunities to put some of these uh, into play um, and, and they are available, they are being used in civilian marketing and when you and I yeah. talked you were kind of surprised that maybe some of them are not being as used as extensively. What other thoughts? There's also an opportunity for a new point of purchase interface and strategy. You know, if we think about how the DOD often recruits, the, it could be also a bit more modernized. Just like with the marketing approach, where you're marketing to people in, in a way that targets younger generations, they also expect everything to be super easy and they can do it online and, and it just goes very rapidly. And so making sure there's an interface and a strategy around that that makes that point of purchase for that potential enlistee, for that potential recruit, makes that super easy super smooth, really nice UI, UX, the whole thing that the, the younger folks are looking for, make that magic happen. Again, removing barriers to the process, making it easier uh, to, to enlist. You can do pretty much anything online now. You can buy a house, you can buy a car. It's hard to join the military online. Well, and that, that's one of the areas where I think improving that, that point of purchase is something we've talked about for some time. If you make it easier, you're going to have more people come along. I mean, think about how many times if you're using a website and it frustrates you and you just close out. Never mind. If that happens with DOD recruits, then you're, you're losing someone who might want to enlist, uh, might, might do really well in the DOD, might do really well as, as, as someone who might, might come through the funnel and, and want to be a, a, a soft professional, right? Might want to come through and be in special operations. But if the website's not going to be as user-friendly as some other things they might use, they may just close it and, and then they're gone. So give me a couple more examples. Okay, I think the first one that's really great is thinking about user-generated content. And I know we've, we've both seen online on, on different platforms, videos of different folks who are in the DOD and some of it's really interesting and exciting and engaging but there could be more of it yeah. and so I think pushing more user generated content is really important and then tied to that you know I think something that's very unfortunate and like I grew up in the 80s and uh, I know you grew up a little just a little before I did uh, because we're about the same age uh, you know I, I, there was at that time you know people unfortunately talked a lot about homeless vets, and we still hear that. But I gotta tell you, out of a lot of the folks I know who've been in the DOD, who've been in the military, a lot of them have become wildly successful. And I know a lot of millionaire vets. Where's the millionaire vets campaign? Why aren't we hearing that? Why is the news story, well, there's there, the homeless vets, right? Why, why are we still hearing this decades later? Why aren't we hearing about millionaire vets? People who go, into the DOD, they join the military, they enlist, they learn skills, they learn how to work with other people, they serve their country, and then they come out, they take those skills, they grow a career, they start a business, they do all kinds of things. They become wildly professionally successful. Why is that story not being told? And, and I'm someone who's a civilian, but who knows and works with a lot of veterans who become wildly successful in their careers. That story should be told all the time and it's just not out there why do you think that might be why do you think these stories aren't more widely understood is it become you're looking at it as an economist and a futurist or is it uh do you think that uh, maybe these people aren't being asked to tell their story maybe some people aren't asked to tell the story maybe it's because you know, sometimes you think about news stories and oftentimes, I'm sure you worked in the, new, the news business for a while, right? I do a lot with the media. You've heard the phrase, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Sad news stories get the top of the, the hour, right? Those are the first things you're gonna hear. Success stories, the happy things you hear, the, the kitten that gets adopted, the, the, the kid who goes on, to, to hometown kid makes good. Success stories, that's in the last couple of seconds of the news show. You almost never hear the good stories because that's not what pulls people in. And I think these kinds of stories are what 
people need to hear is the reality for a lot of people who come into the military because if I think about all the people I know, and I know a lot of people, there are a couple of different ways that people can change their socioeconomic lives. And education is one of them. Serving in the military is the other. And oftentimes serving in the military comes with education opportunities yeah. and benefits, and, right? These are the only proven ways I see around me and the people I know consistently where people can completely shift the economic milieu in which they grew up and have a huge jump up. Those two ways, and of course, like I say, on, on the military side, that also incorporates education opportunities. I think that story needs to be out there, but I think it's maybe not something that, that pulls people so, in. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but do you think there is evidence of a comparative advantage, competitive advantage of people who served in the military? That when they, they serve in the military and they have additional opportunity, you know, some of it's kind of uh, evident in like, like GI Bill and uh, home loan, things like that. You serve honorably, but are there other things in this economic situation where, you know, are, are you more highly recruited if you have military experience? Do you, have you seen any data around that? I mean, I do think yes. Uh, and uh, I think people who do have military background who serve their country who are veterans, right, there is usually in, in many places, right, there's preferential hiring around that. So I think that's true. But more important than any kind of uh, statutory preference that might exist within a, a company's hiring regulations is the fact that most people who've gone through the military have had to work with a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah. And if we think about what does it take to be an effective person operating in the economy today, working for a company, you have to be able to work with people. And that's really, really important. And people you know, who've served in the military have worked with different people in different places, in different cultures. And I think that's an advantage. One of the things we've talked about is the concept of uh, at JSAL, at, at uh, SOCOM, we would call these design inquiry. We bring people in to think about hard problems. Our, our collaboration has kind of been a design inquiry for both of us. So, so uh, what do you think in the process you and I have done in our research, some things that you've discovered or didn't think about, you know, and how do you think if, if, if uh, the military, Department of Defense wants to change or improve their recruiting, how do you think a, a larger experiment of this type, design inquiry, you know, bringing people in to talk about it, how do you think, how has it benefited you and how do you think it might benefit with this problem in the future? I think this is really important, right? Because you can't improve things you don't measure. And what you need here is, I know oftentimes we talk about measuring and data, people are thinking about quantitative numbers, but we're talking about you need qualitative data as well. And you can derive something from that. And I think figuring out some of the things we've talked about, what does it take to market to that younger audience? What kind of user generated content should we be trying to get to? What, how, how do we get to these things that people will react to? What is the right UI UX for the website to make sure that we have an easier point of purchase? Like, how, how do we get to those things? And I think you're absolutely right, design inquiry and, and design thinking in general, you know, thinking about putting the customer first. In this case, the customer is the recruit, is, is the person who's looking to enlist. How do we make sure that those customers, you know, are satisfied and want to buy? And, and that's, I think, that's something that a design inquiry can really help get to what, what are they looking for? Because there are folks that this will be ideal for and that it will help them serve and it will benefit their lives economically, professionally in a tremendous way. How do we make sure we're matching the offering with the people for whom that offering is a good fit? You are an economist but you're also a futurist. Yep. So tell me, tell me a little bit about uh, what a futurist is and what a futurist does. Uh, thank you, thanks for asking, Doug. Yeah, a futurist in my mind, right? I'm always looking at trends of the past, data of the present, and I'm looking at those trends and the data in order to craft a vision of the future. And this is, I think, partially how we got to yeah. our, you know, the, the solutions we talked about today and, and our entire discussion, where we're looking at the, the economics and the demographics, and then we're also looking at the strategic imperatives. And then, all right, if, if these are the trends, 
right? And there's a saying in finance, the trend is your friend, although some of these trends are not very friendly for DOD and self-recruiting. But if the trend is your friend, like don't, don't think it's gonna change, that, that's the trend. All right, that, we also have this strategic imperative. How do we take the data of the world in which we live and the trends in which we have, what does that look like in the future? And then how do we make sure we get what's called a preferred future? How do we get an outcome that solves the problem? In other words, how do we get to the level of recruiting where we can satisfy those strategic imperatives? And that's how we came up with our you know, two groups of solutions. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot of potential here in thinking that way, looking at the trends, looking at the data, craft the view, views of that future, get to the solutions. So part of what we talked about is kind of how the world is today, uh, the current challenges are today. What, uh, what do you, uh, what's, the, what's the trend, you know, my, the trend is my friend, how do you see the next couple of years for recruiting? I think it's probably still gonna be pretty tough because the labor market's likely to be still pretty tight. That being said, if there is uh, an, an aggressive change to try to tap new labor pools, new applicants who could enlist and, and, and be recruited, and if there are new marketing approaches, that can still affect it. It's not going to be easy, but with the right strategic approach, it could be easier. I'd like to thank our guest, Jason Schenker, President of Prestige Economics and Chairman of the Futures Institute for spending some time with us today. If you have any comments about today's presentation, uh, you can email them to thinkjsow at jsow.edu. I am Doug Jordan. Thanks for watching and see you next time.